and I'm thinking, how do I even begin the message? I titled my message, The Finished and Final Word of Jesus Christ. I've been near many near many people who have had or who have taken their last breath. I will not forget one man before he closed his eyes, sent everybody out from the room, told me to sit next to him on his bed, put his, around, his hand around my shoulder, and told me something that I, I don't think I can ever forget. And whatever that man said came true. Now, I don't call him prophet, but the dying words for this man was, don't be intimidated. Don't be pushed around. Let God's word speak. Use your voice. Use what God has given you. You know, they said the words of dying men are the most important words. When you come to the book of Revelation, when you come to the last chapter of the book of Revelation, it's not the dying Jesus on the cross who will cry out, it is finished. In the book of Revelation, he has the last word. And you know what that last word he gives to us in the book of Revelation? It's an invitation. Come to me. Come to me. We look at a world that is so filled with craziness. The things that were saying, you look at it. Even children are saying, I heard my granddaughter say something, I was saying something, and she said, oh, they call me Dido. That's the name for me. I said, Dido, isn't that stupid? You know, God speaks truth out of the mouth of children. And isn't it good that children will speak truth when we adults will try to cover it up? So now we come to the finished and final word of Jesus Christ. Some of you have endured long, hard days with me through this book. But can I say to you, the book of Revelation gives us one premise. It's the only book that promises us a special blessing from God. And do you know the other thing I noticed about the book of Revelation? The enemy does not want you to come to the book of Revelation. So quickly you get intimidated because of the symbols. And people say, I can't understand the book. It does nothing for me. It will do nothing for you if the Spirit of God does not help you understand the words, the last words of Jesus Christ. Because it's the book that prepares you towards your last dwelling place. You see, the book of Revelation gives you your last permanent address. Up to now, all your addresses have been temporary. You're here today, you're there tomorrow, your address is changed. And you know the frustration when you've changed your address, you've written to the postal uh, people and they are supposed to get your uh, address changed and guess what? They don't do it. And then you get a call and said, I've sent you a letter, how come you never replied back? He said, I never got the letter. Well, they didn't get the change of address. In the book of Revelation, God is going to change your address and my address and give us a permanent address and everlasting. So let's look into the word of God. First, I want to read the passage, uh, reading from Revelation 22, verses 6 uh, to the end. Please follow God's word. God's word is more important than what I'm going to say. So let's take in God's word and let the Holy Spirit open our eyes to the truth. In Revelation 22, verse 6, and he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. <clears throat> Verse 7, and behold, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy 
of this book, I, John, and the one who heard and saw these things, and when I heard and saw them, I fell to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book, worship God. I, John, and the one who heard and saw these things, he ends by saying, worship God. Verse 10, and he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I'm coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life, that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, and the sexually immoral, and murderers, and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. He who testifies to this thing says, Surely I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. If we would dare to take time just to meditate on those words, I wonder how we could go to bed at night, how we could wake up the next day, how could we function from the week that would follow, because those words are so loaded, and especially when you haven't finished your business with God. First, we begin with the faithful word of God. We see the accuracy of the word of God. Revelation 22, 6, and he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the, of the prophets, has sent his angel to show you his servants what must soon take place. Folks, these are not words of Peter Valji. These are not words of a Baptist preacher. These are not words of the Pope. These are not words of any man. These are words coming from the Son of God who went on Calvary's cross. And from Calvary's cross, he secured all rights over heaven and earth. And now he's speaking through his servant, John the Apostle. The accuracy of the Word of God. How many times again people say to me, oh, there are a lot of mistakes in the Bible. Really? And many of the people who say this have never studied one segment of one chapter. But they know there are a lot of mistakes in the Bible. Why? Because they heard somebody said, oh, there are mistakes in the Bible. Some people say to me, oh, the Bible is all changed, you know. Really? These are the very people, if IRS charges them one dollar more on their tax, they'll pick on that. And yet we will undermine God's word. This is why in the book of Revelation, Jesus himself is speaking. So you and I know it's not men who is giving out these words. In his word there is warning. There's redemption, there's blessing. 
because with it comes also the invitation. So here, the authority of the word of God, verses 7 to 9. And behold, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And then in verse 8, John says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed this to me. John is so overtaken by the words from God that he just feels this compulsion to fall on his knees and worship. But he turns to the wrong thing to worship. He worships an angel who very quickly corrects him. I'm not the one to be worshipped. I'm a fellow servant. We worship God. <coughs> you know, some of us do great things. And all of a sudden we feel like we can replace God. And people talk well about us. And people say great things about us. Then it's no longer about Christ, the coming king. It's not about Christ, the son of God. It's no longer about Christ who went on Calvary's cross and died for your sin. And I have to remind myself to be very careful. I never step in the place where Christ stands. You see what happened to John. He is overtaken by hearing these words. And he turns to the angel and he falls down to worship. And the angel said, I'm not one to be worshipped. Worship only God. And any church, any institution, religious institution, that calls you to worship a man, no matter how bright, how brilliant, how many good things he's done, don't go there. Learn from the book of Revelation, there's only one we worship, is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So here the warning is very clearly based on the authority of the word of God. So you see in verse 22, but he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and those with those who keep the words of this book, worship God. The greatest tragedy in our church today, we have turned to worship our programs. We have turned to worship entities. You know, we have this rich man, very knowledgeable, and we turn to give worship to them. The church of Jesus Christ is called to worship one and one only Jesus Christ. Believe me, yes, you may call me your preacher, but I'll tell you, I will be the last one to go on the cross to die for your sins. I've got my own to die for. There's only one who died on Calvary's cross, and that is God's only begotten Son. And that's why in Matthew 28, Jesus can say, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And that he's the only one who's qualified to dispense his grace and his mercy towards us. So the book of Revelation makes that very clear. And John began to understand that. And then we see the accessibility of the word of God. <laughs> Revelation 22.10. And then he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. How blind do you have to be not to see what's happening in our world? I just told this to somebody yesterday. I said, don't you see how accurate the Bible is? Because the Bible said, these things will happen. And I'll tell you, in one sense, it's exciting to see the truth of the Word of God. But it's also frightening because it's happening in real time. I'm just hearing teachers saying about the rebellious attitude of children in school. And they can do nothing about it. The Bible says in the last days, Rebellion will rise up. Read about what's happening all through the world and look at the rebellious spirit that has captured mankind. And can I say this to you? You may not, don't have to agree with me, but it looks like in these days, there's almost like a demonic spirit 
that's gone out. You know, one time somebody did something wrong, and when you confronted the person, they said, yes, I've done wrong, I deserve to be punished. Today, you see somebody who's done something horrible, you look at them and you confront them, and they look at you and smile. And says, you think what I've done is bad? I will do even worse. Folks, one of the best things I thank God for, I lived in Africa. And the few glimpses in my life, God showed me the manifestation of a demonic spirit in the human being are horrible sights. And now it is so prevalent today that we even in the church do not recognize that the rebellious spirit that is around us is demonic. That's how far we have come because we have moved further away from God's word. People say to me all the time, oh, pastor, you say these people are not going to come to church. Can I say to you very kindly, not being callous or careless, if they don't come to church, it's because they have a spirit that is not the spirit of God. Because the spirit of God will attract you to him. The spirit of this world and the demonic spirit will repel you from him. Don't forget, this is the finished and final word of Jesus Christ. So, remember in Daniel chapter 12, Daniel was given this prophecy because he said, God, okay, I've been in the land of Babylon. I have served faithfully. I have not deviated from your word. But God, what is going to happen? He was interested to know what's going to happen to his people who had been captured and pillaged by the Babylonians. And God begins to give Daniel prophetic words of the future. And this is in chapter 12, verse 4. Listen to how the word reads. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. He said, what is God talking about to them about the time of the end? Well, we are in that time. Many shall run to and fro. Listen to God's word. Look at the busyness of our world. Man, if you hear a few flights cancel, you see droves of people at the airport languishing. And then it also says in verse 4, Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Recently we stopped at a restaurant and the waiter came and next to him came a little cart, self-driven, bringing my food. So I'm wondering, who should I take? <laughs> What's going in an in, in, in AI machine want dollars for? Believe me. But isn't it interesting the world we are living in? So you see what's happening. Knowledge shall increase. And it is, we can see it. And then in verse 5 says, Then I, Daniel, looked and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream, How long shall it be till the end of these wonders. And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand towards heaven and swore by him who lives forever. That's in reference to Jesus Christ. That it would be for a time, times and a half a time. And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, O oh my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? Verse 9, Daniel 12. He said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined. But the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But those 
who are wise shall understand. Where will you get this wisdom to understand what was told to Daniel to seal up the prophecy? You come to the book of Revelation. And folks, dare anybody say, well, I really don't care much about the book of Revelation. That thought comes from the devil himself. He does not want you to receive the last word. I, I remember when I was deeply in love. Can you believe that? <laughs> and my wife and I got married on a Monday. I left her on Wednesday. And first I was in Kenya. And boy, just to call her up and hear her breathe was enough for me. And then from there, we came back. I went to Dallas to finish my studies. She went back to Yarmouth to finish her teaching. And just the letters we would write when I did write, and the last word on that letter is, I love you. Wow. Hottest place, Dallas, Texas. You could fry your eggs on the sidewalk. Studies were hard. Working, sweating, studying. But those words lifted me up and kept me going. Because I know what I was waiting for. What are you waiting for? Do you see the love letter God's son has written to you and me? Let me move on. You see, this word is accessible to us. The Bible tells us that. Romans chapter 10, verse 8 and 9, 4, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, in your hearts. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Today we also have the problem of easy believism. Just say yes and you're in. Let me tell you. Go ahead, say yes, and think you're in. Because when you are in Christ, He changes the direction of your life. He changes the attitude of the heart, the mind, and the spirit. He also changes what you're pursuing. That's how drastic it is. And that's why we come close enough. We flirt with Jesus Christ. We flirt with Christianity because we don't want God to change us. We just want to have enough brownie points that one day we come near to heaven. Guess what's going to happen? Lord, I did go to church. I didn't have to put up with that pastor. I didn't have to put up with those people. I didn't even like their cooking. But guess what? He knows your heart. He knows my heart. And he knows today where you stand or where you sit. He knows what's going between the ears. He knows what's in the heart. So we come to the finished work of Christ. We begin with the faithful word of God. Now we come to the finished work of Christ. You see, God provided a sacrifice in the Garden of Eden for Adam and Eve. Remember, after Adam and Eve had sinned, that disobeyed God with a clear teaching of God's truth. And guess what? When God came, they were afraid and they were hiding. Do you know the first killing that was done was done by God in the Garden of Eden to appease, to cover the sin of Adam and Eve. That was the picture that he would send his only begotten son to die for the sin of the whole world. You remember the first one of the sons of uh, Adam and Eve, Cain? The Bible says that Cain offered a more acceptable sacrifice to God. Why was that? His brother brought some vegetables and I'm going to give to God and I might as well just do what I can. But Cain realized life for life and he offered a lamb because he knew he was in desperate need for forgiveness from God. That's a whole other thing there. 
the finished work of Christ settles what we are, where we are, and whose we are. That's why we always make an invitation to everyone to come to the cross. If ever this pastor makes an invitation say, come to me, please, it's the day to really put me in tar and feather and put me to, to birth. We are never called to call anybody to ourselves. We are called to call people to the cross, to Jesus Christ, because he's the author and finisher of our life. You see, the finished work of Christ. First, it settles what we are. Revelation 22, 11. Let the evil doer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. I have seen somebody taking themselves through so much trouble, and I've told them, you don't have to. God will help you change. Many have turned, looked at me and smiled and said, you are a joke. Because I did not understand the little pleasure they had before they would cry out to rescue them. And then there are those who play the religious games. They want to be in the game, but they want to stay so far away. God does not allow there. See, in the book of Revelation, the last chapter, he makes it very clear. Let the evil do still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. You know, that verse is not only a warning, but it's also an invitation. And it settles where we are, verses 12 to 15. You see, we have the promise of his coming to sustain us. He said, Behold, I am coming. And we have the provision of his cross to sustain us. He said, how can that be? You see, if he's promised that he's coming to get us, but we have to be a prepared people. How do we get a prepared people? The cross. And you know, people say, oh man, can you just give up on the cross? No, I cannot. You see, because even the hymn writer wrote, at the cross, at the cross, what happened? I saw the light. And then what happened? The burden of my soul rolled away. Many of us look good. We clean up. We dress up. We come. But deep down inside there is an emptiness that is gnawing at you. You do this to satisfy. It gives you a little bit of satisfaction, but then just like an ice cream on a hot day, once the spoon is gone in your mouth, it's melted in your mouth, it's done with. And the soul is still longing for that very truth because that's what you and I were created for. That's why the Bible says the truth will set you free. Whose truth? What truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So here we come, the finished work of Christ. It settles what we are, it settles where we are. We have the promise of his coming to sustain us. Behold, I'm coming. And we have the provision of, of the cross to sustain us. Verse 14. So let's look at God's word in verse 12 to verse 15. Behold, I'm coming, bringing my recompense with me, to repay each one for what he has done. And then he gives us this tremendous word and a warning, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Now you know, sometimes we think, when I'm under the blankets, when I'm in the house, when I'm in the closet, God cannot really see me. So we carry on with the foolishness. And yet the Bible tells us there's nothing hid from his sight. Mm -hmm. I tell you the most intriguing thing. I worked at the border between Holton and uh, New Brunswick. And uh, I was on the crew of maintenance. What would intrigue me is they had this truck with metal sights going through this x-ray machine. And they could see right through the metal 
to what you were carrying in the truck. It still baffles me how they're able to do that. Well, I've gone for a few x-rays, and yeah, I can see how they can put so much light through my body to see what... I'm glad they can see the sin in my heart, but they can see my organs and all that. It was intriguing when my daughter, before she had a baby, she took what they call... Ultrasound. 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 And we could see this little person forming in her belly. But how do you see right through metal? If men can make something like that, what about God who created man? Let me leave it at that. Our time is gone. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have right to enter, have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter the city by the gates. Remember, we looked at verses 1 to 5 in Revelation 22. It gives us the description of the city. It gives us the description of the river flowing and the trees that bring healing, the leaves heal the nations. A continuous, constant healing because the presence of Jesus Christ is there among his people. And then in verse 15 he says, outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I have to go back in my own mind and say, Lord, where do I stand with you? Which part am I included in? It's a question everyone needs to ask to their own hearts. And then it not only settles what we are, it settles whose we are. Somebody used to say to me, everybody belongs to somebody. And I thought he meant that because the wife was quite bossy. I never understood that saying, I just took it. He meant that the wife who was quite bossy, possessed him, so that's where he belonged, down the years I began to realize everybody belongs to somebody. And when the realization came that I needed the cross of Calvary to forgive my sins and come to Christ is the day a choice was made. I either belong to Christ or I belong to the world. There is no shortcut in between folks. There's no halfway in between. It settles whose we are. Revelation 20 to 16. I, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. Christ, he's the lover of his church. He's the Lord of the universe. He's the light of creation. We who belong to him, how thankful we ought to be. You know, to have a sense of belonging is quite amazing. Would you allow me a few more minutes as I finish this message and finish the book of Revelation? The final witness of the Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit is the one that gives us the word of God that imposed himself on the writers of the books of the Bible. And that's why the Bible is not a book. Sure, in translation, some words are left out and all that. But I can tell you, having studied four years of my life about the inerrancy of scriptures, and even then I found I knew so little the final witness of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that superimposed the Word of God 
See, we begin with the faithful word of God, the finished work of Christ, and now we finish with the final witness of the Spirit. The last welcome. Revelation 22, 17. The Spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hear say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. The invitation is there. Come. Come. How many times when I've faltered in my life, I've got to go before my Lord and Savior and say, Lord, will you take me back in? He says, isn't my word come? Then mm -hmm. Jesus said, come unto me all you labor and heavy laden, and he will do what? Give, Give us rest. See how troubled we are in this world. Some of us are troubled. We are facing so many uh, battles uphill. But his invitation is come. The wonderful word come, an invitation. And then there's a dreadful word which I need to remind you, depart which is a rejection. What will you hear when you come near the throne of God? Will you hear come or will you hear depart? The last warning, verses 18 to 19. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, please take note of God's word. I'm I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the place described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. The last warning. Can you turn around and say, I did not know. I did not hear. Or will you be honest with your own heart and say, yes, I heard. And you can say, by the Spirit of God, I know I need to turn around. Either you will follow him in today's difficult world with all the difficulty they're going to pose towards you as a Christian. Or you're going to turn and run the other way. And these are hard words. Because listen to the last word that we are given. John is now saying, he who testifies to these things says, surely I'm coming soon. Amen. And then he says, come Lord Jesus. And then in verse 21, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me and a wretch like you. The difference is, are you willing to bow your knee to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords before he appears? <coughs> or are you going to carve for yourself a road for your own liking? I'm sorry, I can't leave you there. Because I had to see from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. You know, we preachers lie too. I told you a few more minutes. Two more minutes. Genesis begins with creation. Revelation ends with new creation. In Genesis, we have the first Sabbath. Revelation closes with the holy rest in the new creation. Genesis gives us the first Adam, head of all humanity. Revelation leaves us with the second Adam, the head of new humanity. Genesis gives us Eve, the wife of the first Adam, sinning, condemned, and sorrowing. Revelation leaves us with the second Eve, the bride of Christ, exalted, holy, and glorious. In Genesis, we have the exclusion from the tree of life. Revelation leaves us with the access to it and authority over it. In Genesis, we have an earth cursed. 
In Revelation, we have earth fully delivered from the curse. Genesis gives us Satan tempting and bruising. In Revelation, we leave him bruised and in the lack of fire forever. In Genesis, we have the first sob and tear. In Revelation, all tears and sighing are forever gone. Where do you want to end up? We know the beginning, and now we know the ending. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, who died on Calvary's cross, so that instead of condemned for eternity, we can be saved for eternity and be in your presence. Thank you for the grace that you show us even today, that we are able to hear your word and have an opportunity to turn away from this world and turn to you. This is the day you have made and we will rejoice and be glad in it, for you are our God and King. For this we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.